Hey, this is Josh Neese. I oversee media here at Oasis Church. I wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. This message will build your faith, inspire you, and help you see how God is moving in your life. Before we get into the message, if this is your first time joining us, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, knock that notification bell so you can get notified every time we release a new message just like this. Now, enjoy the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. This message is called The Worship Heaven Wants. Can you say that? The Worship Heaven Wants. And we're looking in Mark chapter 4. Now, a little bit of the backstory because I don't want to read the whole chapter, although we're going to read quite a bit of scripture leading up to this, is that Jesus and the disciples are hungry. They don't have food. The disciples go looking for food and they leave Jesus at the well and... Jesus strikes up a conversation with the woman at the well. And we're going to pick it up in verse 10. And um, because Jesus has asked, for, asked her for water, and then she's, you know, having this conversation with him. And Jesus says this in verse 10. Jesus answered, said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one, one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is a powerful passage about the ministry of Jesus and revival actually ends up breaking out in Samaria for two days based on this conversation that Jesus has where he gives the woman at the well a supernatural snapshot of what she's gone through in her life. Amen? And they begin to talk about worship and Jesus begins to give instruction about the worship heaven wants. And I want to find out all about it. But before we go any farther, I want to define the word worship uh, based on the Greek and Hebrew words. It means to bow down towards. It means to serve. It means to do. It means to accomplish. It, to, it means to make or manufacture. To worship means to shape or to form. These are some of the Greek words that you'll find when you study the word worship. Now, one of the things Jesus said to this woman, he said, you worship what you do not know. And as a pastor, and when the Lord gave me this word to share, I really felt like that was a big part of this, that much of the church today is worshiping a false image of a God that cannot be found in Scripture. How many of you know our worship needs to be accurate? We need to see Him for who He is. Amen? Now, 
Jesus makes this statement, the true worshipers. True worshipers. Can you say that? True worshipers. If there are true worshipers, there as a necessity must also be false worshipers. Does that make sense? Otherwise, he would never use the word true worshipers. You can tell as much what the Bible doesn't say as what it does say. And here Jesus uses the term true worshipers. How many of you, and I know it's everybody, want to be a true worshiper? That is your heart's desire. That's where we're going with this. That's the rest of this sermon, what it's about. Turn over to Mark chapter 7, because Jesus doesn't go into all the detail about what a true worshiper is. He gives us some hints, but I want to look deeper because he said some other things. In Mark chapter 7, verse 3 through 7, the Bible says this, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy to you, hypocrites, As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Here Jesus gives us two big pillars about what false worship looks like. So let's look at this real quickly. The first thing he says is drawing near with your lips, but not your heart. Everybody say, going through the motions. We've got to, listen, when we come to church or we go to an event or we're at home worshiping God, whenever we do it, we have to engage our heart with God. Not just go through motions, but really engage our heart. He wants a heart to heart, spirit to spirit, deep calls unto deep connection with us. Not just going through motions, amen? Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, he said, I'm tired of your sacrifices and all that. Why? Because they were just doing sacrifices, but their heart wasn't in it. God wants our heart, amen? He wants a heart to heart relationship with him. And he says, People that just draw near with their lips, but their heart's far from him, that's not true worship, that's false worship. But then he says something I probably never would have thought of. That happens quite often as I read the scripture, (laughs) I must say. He says this, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. What does this have to do with worship? He says, if you sit in a house that teaches as doctrines, the commandments of men, you're going to end up in false worship. Wow, what does Jesus mean? How does my doctrine affect my worship? Well, let's let's look at that um, a little bit closer. He says, in vain, in vain they worship me. That's not a good word, is it? Vain. I looked up the word vain. It's it's very uh, informational. (laughs) The word vain means having or showing excessively high opinion of one's appearance, hmm, it's outward focused. It's appearance focused. It's putting on a show. It's lights and smoke and mirror and all that. Look, I'm not against lights. I'm not even against when people use, uh, you know, hazer machines so that the lights look nice. I don't have a problem with that. Just don't replace the presence of God and the glory of God with that. Okay, keep the presence of God and keep the glory of God. I'm not against people dressing nice or looking nice, but that is not the substance of biblical worship. The substance of biblical worship is the heart. It's a heart connection with God, right? Now, if you go on and look at the rest of the word vain, it's very informational as well. It means useless, worthless, futile, false, producing no results. How many of you don't want to worship like that? I don't want anything to do with worship like that, do you? Because it doesn't produce results. In other words, there are mighty results that can happen as a result of worshiping, amen? Now, why would Jesus say this? We have our answer back in Mark chapter four. Can you turn back to Mark chapter four? Mark chapter four, verse 23 and 24. It says, the true worshipers, say I'm a true worshiper. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, 
for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must, everybody say must, worship in spirit and truth. And so for the rest of this, we're going to talk about what it means to worship in truth and worship in spirit. And we're going to start with what it means to worship in truth. The word truth means certainty, reality, steadfastness, trustworthiness, faithfulness, and constancy. Now, I can hear somebody saying, wait a minute. Truth is a person and his name is Jesus. I agree with you. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me or but by me. How many of you agree with that? That's true. So truth is a person and his name is Jesus. To worship in truth actually has more than one meaning. Let's look, let's look at at least two different meanings, what it means to worship in truth. Number one, to worship the Father in truth means to come through Jesus, who is the narrow gate, the door, and the only name under heaven that erases our sins and reconciles us to the Father. You cannot worship God coming through any other name. You can't worship God coming through the name of uh, Muhammad or Krishna or any other name out there. There's only one name under heaven that there's only one spotless lamb of God who shed his blood on a cross to atone for our sins so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. There's only one name and that name is Jesus. Amen. Can I get an amen on that? He is the only one. That's what one, that's to worship in truth it means you got to come through the truth who is the person. The second thing to worship in truth how many of you know Jesus is the Logos made flesh? He is the written word of God wrapped in flesh. So he is the embodiment of the written word clothed in human reality. So for me to worship Jesus, I have to be a student and studier of the word of God. Amen? I have to be a student of the word of God. Why? To worship in truth is to take the fullness of the reality of the Logos word of God, amen, and allow it to be grafted into my soul so that my conscious construct of God is perfectly aligned with who he is accurately revealed to be in his word. What does the word of God do as I read it? It is building a conscious construct in my heart of mind, of the reality of who God is, so that when I worship, I know the one I'm worshiping because I've seen him in his word. Smith Wigglesworth said, I cannot understand God by my feelings, but I can understand God by what the word of God says about him, amen? Now, I believe you can experience supernatural feelings from the presence of God. And some of you are feelers and you get around people and you feel certain things or you get in an environment and you feel certain things. Some of you are perceivers and you just have a direct instant revelation, and you just have a sudden knowing, and that's another prophetic gifting, and there's different ways the prophetic operates, and one's not better than the other. It's just let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit wants to do, right? And here, in James 1.21 in the Amplified, it says this, so get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness, and in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. Now, salvation is an instantaneous work of grace when a person calls upon the name of the Lord, isn't it? It's not a progressive, it's instant. But the, sa the saving of the soul is a continuous progressive work throughout your whole lifetime. And you can even backslide in your soul. Did you know that? That's why Paul said in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice the word renewing is continuous, present tense. It's a lifetime of reading and studying and hearing the word of God preached. Because how many of you know all around us in this world is all kinds of other voices and all kinds of things coming against us, going the other direction, people not serving God, you know, all the media gates and things like that that try and take you the other direction. And we need to hear the word. We need to read the word. We need to study the word so that 
continually so that our mind stays in a maximum state of renewal because they are our fringe benefits of having a renewed mind. Amen? Matter of fact, if you want to achieve the plan of God for your life, the maximum of the plan of God, it happens as your mind is renewed because you need to start to think like God thinks. And that's not a default. We get that by putting the thoughts of God from the word of God inside us, right? All right. So why do I bring all this up? This is why sitting under bad doctrine and false teaching uh, produces false worship because it means your conscious construct of God is an idol in your own imagination instead of the fullness of who the word says he is. He is. And see, there's this trend in churches today that only want to talk about a few things in the word. And so people's construct of God, their conscious construct of God that's being formed in their spirit, in their soul, is not an accurate picture of who God's word says, the fullness of who God is, right? How many of you know I'm telling the truth? And so a lot of people are worshiping this idea of God, but you cannot read the, if you read the Bible, it would not line up whatsoever. What are they actually worshiping? They're worshiping really an idol that they've constructed. They're worshiping another Jesus, but they're not worshiping the Jesus of scripture. And so we have to watch out for another Jesus. Amen? Let me read this to you. You might enjoy this. There's a prophet out there named Jeremiah Johnson. You can follow him on Facebook. He got this revelation uh, just recently and put this out on actually 813. I got this revelation about worship around August 1st. Between August 1st and August 13th, Uh, a famous worship leader came out and said, basically, I'm leaving the faith. A lot of you know about that. Um, Some of you don't. You can look it up. But the Lord, before that happened, the Lord gave me this teaching on worship. And I believe it directly answers why we see people leaving the faith. They do it because they're not grounded in the word. And they haven't had a real encounter with God. They've been worshiping this image of Jesus that's not the real Jesus. Amen? Let me, re- let me read this to you. This is a prophetic visitation from another Jesus. In several of the books, this is Jeremiah Johnson, in several of the books I've authored, I've written in depth concerning the three different visitations I have received from Jesus Christ. Each encounter was terrifying, breathtaking, and life-changing. As a result of these visitations, I have defined the true fear of the Lord as beholding pure beauty that makes you tremble. Last night in a prophetic dream, he appeared to me again. But as I drew closer, I instantly realized it was not him. It was an imposter. I grabbed him by the throat and said, who are you? With dazzling eyes and a type of glaring seduction that I will never forget, he said, I'm another Jesus. I immediately let him go. And he began to laugh, a bone-chilling laugh that went through my spine. For some reason, I began demanding what his marching orders were. Where was he going and why? With anger, he said, I can only go where I'm welcome and not where I please because the Son of Man restrained me. I said, who would ever welcome you into their midst? He began to laugh again a deep belly laugh and said, I'm currently making my way all over the West Coast. Many of the churches there love me. They also love me in the lecture halls of America in the East where they openly debate theology. And most of all, I am readily welcome on many worship teams in America. They just love for me to write the songs and lead the people in worship. Immediately he vanished and I sat up in my bed. I'm still processing But I believe it is time for many of us, though it might be difficult to start coming to grips with the truth that there could be another Jesus writing many worship songs in America. There is another Jesus walking in the lecture halls at Christian and liberal universities debating theology. And this false Christ is infiltrating West Coast churches like never before. And he won't stop until he is exposed, resisted, and cast out. Remember this, another Jesus and spirit can only go where it is welcome. The son of man has restrained him and he will not enter into places who know and worship the true Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah, I hope that helped you a little bit. I enjoyed that because it confirmed in this teaching 
You see, God wants us to worship him in truth. What does that mean? It means to worship him with an accurate picture of who he really is. Amen? What, let me ask you a question, because I've been to the throne of God. That's how I got saved. I got caught up to the throne, and I, I, had, a, I had an encounter with the Father, and it changed my life forever. 7.45 p.m., Terre Haute Church of God, 2512 South Thompson Street in Terre Haute, Indiana, and I've never been the same again. So when people say they've had this encounter and that encounter, and it hasn't had a life-changing impact, I kind of scratch my head. Because the angels that go around the throne nonstop, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. Do you realize that's been going on forever already? Do you realize eternity past doesn't have a starting date? Put that in your brain and bake it. Eternity past doesn't have a beginning. There is no beginning. God's eternal. He doesn't have a start. He's always been. And as long as the angels have existed, because they were created, they did have a beginning. The same angels have been seeing the Father. And every time they see him, they have such a powerful new encounter with the, his glory, and they see something they've never seen before, and they fall down on their face, and they cry, holy, holy, holy. And that's the song that's been singing for quite some time. <laughs> Think about that. What is the number one attribute of God? He's holy. That's what they're saying, right? They're the closest to him. I think they have a pretty good view. I know when I went to the throne, the holiness of God was just as Jeremiah Johnson said. It was beyond words to express. Amazing and awesome. I'm telling you what, our God is a holy God. He is a loving father. He's also a holy and a righteous judge. He's many things. We can't just embrace part of who he is and only talk about part of who he is because that's what we like and that's what makes us feel good. We got to look at the whole big picture of who he is. And he is good. Jesus said there's none good but God. But his goodness may not perfectly fit with the theology of many churches in the United States of America. I'm just saying. I'm not welcoming that other Jesus into this church. I want the, I want the real the genuine and only the real Jesus here. Amen? So that other one isn't coming in, but I want to read that to you. Amen? Now, if we sit under bad teaching, now, let me go, the, go another step with this, because the, the defector, the famous defector of faith, his name is Marty Sampson, and he's been with Hillsong, with, and written tons of songs with Hillsong. He's very famous. But the Bible talks about doctrine here. Who sets doctrine in the church? I'll tell you who. Apostles and prophets set the doctrine. Jesus Christ is himself the chief cornerstone. You need to get your doctrine from apostles and prophets. This is an apostolic house. I'm not a pastor, and I'm I'm first an apostle, and I'm second a pastor. But why do I say that? It's be, And, you know, I don't have a problem with that. You know, because Paul and every other minister in the New Testament, the very first thing they said is, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ and I'm an apostle or whatever it was they were called, right? I didn't ask for what I am, but I have a responsibility to stand in the office I'm called to. So part of my job is to watch doctrine. I have a passion for doctrine and teaching. And when I see the church getting away from scripture and getting off on these tangents, it really bothers me. And part of my calling is to bring it back to the middle of the road of what the plumb line of scripture is, amen? And that's, we, we need doctrine, God's doctrine from heaven that is accurate. And how do you find it? You find it in the word of God, amen? So, amen. All right, Mark 7 says this. When our teaching, and we're sitting under bad teaching, what happens is, the worship is youth, useless, worthless, futile, false. And here it says it produces no results. I'm not interested in worship that doesn't produce results. How about you? I want to experience worship that produces results. So if futile, vain worship produces no results, 
what kind of results does real worship produce? Let me read this to you. Um, well, I gave this testimony before. A couple weeks ago in a worship service here, um, John Kieschnick was dealing with numbness in your hands, right? And during the worship, the time of worship, the presence of God came in and Luke did the transition. And during the transition, he released healing. And what happened to your hands? They got healed, right? The numbness went out of his hands. How, you'd had that two years? Two years and the numbness. Why was that? Because the church was worshiping in spirit and in truth because we have a powerful worship leader, Israel, who loves Jesus and is going after the presence of God. And what happened? The presence of God came in and real worship produces results where people get healed, people get delivered without anybody even laying hands on them. If you're in an atmosphere of worship, anything can happen. Amen? Amen? Now, here's what else that happens in worship, in true worship I love. One of the words for worship is to make or manufacture, to shape or form. Whatever we worship, we are pursuing and we're becoming like, okay? Whatever we worship, we're pursuing and we're becoming like. So when we worship God, we are doing ourselves the greatest favor we could possibly do because we are beholding Him and in that process, amen, We are being shaped, manufactured, and formed in his image. Some of you have already thought of the scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So think of this. When you worship him in sincerity, reality, and truth, you are becoming every moment more powerful, wise, bright, beautiful, glorious, supernatural, compassionate, wealthy, healthy, and good. I'm telling you, when you worship God, you're doing yourself the greatest favor ever. Amen? Some people think God needs worship because he's insecure. No, when we worship God, listen, it, we're doing ourselves the greatest favor ever. Amen? When we're, we behold Him, we are becoming like Him. We're being changed. We're being molded. We're being transformed. That's the worship God in truth. It's to sit under good teaching so that our conscious construct of who God is is an accurate picture that lines up with Scripture because Jesus is the Word made flesh. He's not the Word I imagined up. Amen. All right, to worship in spirit. Mark 4, 23 and 24. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The word spirit means breath. It means mind. It means intellect. It means wind. How many of you know God is a spirit? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you got born again, what part of your being changed? It's the human spirit got born again. And because your human spirit got born again, you are capable of fellowship, communion, and intimacy with God because that's only spirit to spirit because God is a spirit. Amen? So to worship in spirit is to have my spirit become one with his spirit. Let me read some scriptures to you. At the new birth, you and I, guess what happened? We got in Christed. We got in Christed. Isn't that good news? For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That body is the body of Christ. When you got born again, you got baptized. You got the first baptism. What's the first baptism? It's where you're taken out of the kingdom of darkness and you are immersed and whelmed into the body of Jesus. And that's where you live and move and have your being. It's in Christ. Hallelujah. I wish you guys would wake up. (laughs) Quietness is not a fruit of the spirit. (laughs) Listen to this. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Think about that. The Bible actually calls you and me Christ because we're part of Christ. We're part of his body. 
Is that amazing? I mean, you start thinking about that and you're just like, is that, wow. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, isn't it? Now think about this, Ephesians 2, 6. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in the anointed Jesus and in his anointing. When Jesus died, your old man died. When he was buried, your old life was buried. When he came alive, you came alive. When he resurrected in Christ, you were raised with him. When he sat at the right hand of God, the place of the most power and glory in the universe, when you were born again, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, you're in Christed. Then you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I like to think of it like this. Christ is like an aquarium, and I'm like a fish that's been put into that aquarium. I'm swimming around in Jesus. Hallelujah. Exploring him. Amen? But I've been, put in, I've been born again. I've been put in Christ. I've been raised together and seated in Christ in heavenly places, filled with the Holy Ghost, and Christ is hidden in God. I'm hidden with Christ in God. Wow, <laughs> is that awesome when you really start thinking about that? It just doesn't get any better than that, does it, church? We've got to find out in our mind about these things so we can take advantage. Colossians 3.3 says this, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen? Hallelujah. My granny didn't die a few days ago. She died decades ago. And when I got around her, I saw Christ. I saw Christ in her, the hope of glory. The day you die is your best day ever. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about when you surrender to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life I live by the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you realize your faith has already walked on the water? It's cast out legion. It's uh, raised Lazarus four days dead. It's translated a boat full of people in the middle of the night. It's uh, fed the multitudes with 12 50-pound baskets left over, and it's raised itself from the dead. That's the faith that was given to you when you were born again. You didn't get human in faith. You got the faith of the Son of God. Your faith will do everything Jesus' faith did. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen? Because he gave you that faith. Glory to God. Amen? So to be in Christ, it means I am submerged into the body of Jesus in heavenly places, drinking of one spirit with him, which is Holy Spirit. I'm a member of his one spirit body. My old separate existence is gone, and my new existence is one with him continually. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So it is a place of constant union fellowship, spiritual reality, and abiding glory. And that's before I consciously engage him in worship. That's just in neutral. That's just when you're in neutral and going about life, that's your position in God. Think about that. We need to wake up and live in our potential. We've been living before, below our privilege, church. We have an inheritance. We are sons of God. We are not mere men. Amen? We have authority. We have power. We have dominion. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Amen? Yeah. We need to think different. If I believe these things, how hard is it to hear God, experience His presence, experience fresh, vital, inflowing, infilling of Holy Spirit, or receive answers, wisdom, healing, or supernatural provision. It's not hard, is it? Because I'm connected with heaven. You're connected and in fellowship with heaven. Amen? So to worship in spirit is to engage the spiritual part of my being with God who is a spirit. And the easiest way to enter in to worship is to follow the formula laid out in Psalm 100. Enter his gates with thanksgiving 
and enter His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. Do you have abiding glory? Yes, you do. But there's also something that happens when you begin to praise God and offer the fruit of your lips. When you begin to sing and you begin to worship, the tangible glory of God begins to manifest. That which is uh, in latency becomes a reality in your presence, in your manifested presence. Amen? Because He's manifested. Hallelujah. So thanking him, blessing his name, praising him, engages his manifest presence and reality. Think about Psalms 22, 3. But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. Think about this. God is enthroned in praise. What situation do you need God to manifest heaven on earth in. Start praising him for his finished work and promise in that situation. Hallelujah. I remember when I broke my wrist riding a motorcycle and I went to the doctor and they showed me the compound fracture on the x-ray and said, you need to go see the orthopedic surgeon. But that scripture we, we read in Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. And I started meditating. He heals all my diseases. He heals all my diseases. He, can you feel that increase? It's like a water, it's like a bucket filling with water. He heals all my diseases. I begin to declare that. Whatever you need healing on, you could just say he heals all. All my diseases. Shoulders are being healed right now. (laughs) Ha ha. He heals. And I begin to meditate right now on the fact that, and begin to praise him. And my hand was healed. My wrist was healed. I didn't have to get the surgery, which I already declared years ago I'd never have to get a surgery, and I never have had a surgery. But my hand was healed. My wrist was healed supernaturally put back together. I can curl as much with this arm as actually more with this arm than I can this arm. I can bench press just the same. I can do everything just as if it never happened. Why? Because Jesus is real. His word works. And when I begin to praise him over that promise, heaven manifested. What do you need to manifest in your life? God is no respecter of persons and he'll do it for you. Even when the doctors give you No hope of a natural solution. God bless doctors. I love doctors. If there weren't doctors, a lot of Christians would be dead. Amen. But I love supernatural healing too. Amen. (laughs) But when you begin to praise God, God gets enthroned in your presence. And when the throne of God comes, look, is there any sickness in heaven? Is there anybody in heaven that's got a cold right now? Nobody's got a cold in heaven. Everybody is feeling all right. Amen. Matter of fact, nobody has any hair loss. Nobody's overweight. Everybody is young and vibrant. Woo! Glory! (laughs) Yeah, some of you are really excited about that. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) Amen? So we've got that to look forward to, but when heaven shows up on earth, earth does not change heaven. Heaven changes earth, right? We're almost done here. We have a mind that wonders and a body with desires. So one of the quickest ways to enter into his presence is praying and worshiping in other tongues. This is heaven's mind bypass so we can have heart-to-heart intimacy with God. How many of you know sometimes your mind just wants to go a hundred different directions? But you can begin to pray in other tongues. You can begin to worship in other tongues and you're doing a mind bypass and you're going straight spirit to spirit. That's a real good thing, isn't it? (laughs) Because your heart can go places your mind can't. Um, Anyway, all right, let's wrap this up. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Singing is a form of worship, and we can do it in English or in other tongues, all right? And we're going to wrap up. The last scripture we're going to read is in Ephesians 5, if you want to turn over there. Ephesians 5, verse 17. This is Paul's Paul's prescription for spirit-filled living. We need to live full of the Spirit. 
this is probably one of the most difficult times ever in the history of mankind to live continually in the Spirit. But Paul tells us how to do it. Let's look at this. Ephesians 5.17, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. All right. There are six practices Paul's out, Paul outlines here to live a spirit-filled life. And by the way, when he says in Ephesians 5.18, uh, but be filled with the spirit, uh, there's a Greek word there that actually means continuous present tense. So it actually means to be being filled. That means be being filled, continuous present tense, be being filled. How are you doing? Well, I'm be being filled right now. How are you Amen. doing? I've decided I'm just going to go through life in every conscious waking moment and I'm going to engage my faith that I'm being being filled because I'm a lot better and nicer filled with the Holy Ghost than I am filled with James Fortune. I find that out. Yeah, that's true. Have you found that out about yourself too? You're a lot better and nicer and sweeter and and more useful to God filled with the Holy Ghost than filled with yourself. (laughs) <laughs> now, here's the, here's the ditch. Some people say, Lord, less of me and more of you. Look, the Lord had less of him. less He had all of him and none of you, and he didn't like it. He wanted you and you and you and you and every one of you. He loves you, okay? But we can be filled with the Spirit, and it'll help us out. Okay, let's look at these. Number one, know and settle in your heart the will of God is for you to be continually filled with Holy Spirit. If you think that's just an occasional thing, you're going to stop the process. Know that God wants to fill you nonstop every day. Every day you can wake up and just lift your hands and say, Lord, I receive a fresh infilling right now so that I can live this day in victory and glory and in fellowship and communion and presence and see miracles and signs and wonders and life change, first of all, that being mine. (laughs) Amen? So know It is the will of God for you to be being filled. Number two, speak to yourselves in hot psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? You're speaking to yourself. You can walk around and speak to yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen? And you just start speaking the word, whatever, a a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song. It could be something known or unknown. You can do it prophetically on on the spot and stir up the prophetic gifting and prophetic praise with God. And, And that's how David got these psalms and others got these songs. They just went out in the Holy Ghost and started praising God and God gave them psalms, right? You can do that too in developing the prophetic. Number three, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, when you just kind of walk around with a song in your heart and a song on your lips, you live in the presence of God. Why? He's continually being enthroned on your praises. Number four, give thanks to the Father in the name of Jesus. Listen, no matter how bad it seems your day is going, if you will stop for a moment and think about what God has done for you, you've got something to praise Him for. I mean, all you got to do is is go read about hell. (laughs) Amen. And then realize you're not going there and say, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. <laughs> if, if, if this life went totally, it was a total bummer, which it's not in God. But if it was, you've got heaven to look forward to for all eternity. You are set up and the future is so bright, you got to wear shades, right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Giving thanks. You know, you can't complain and give thanks in the same sentence. If you're somebody that goes around and complains about everything, you need to repent. That's a sin. And when you complain, you actually invite destruction. How many of you want want destruction in your life? I didn't think anybody was a taker on that one. Um, That was just a freebie. That didn't cost you anything, right? So when you are thankful, you're attracting God's glory and his favor. Amen? Amen? All right. I can teach something else on that. We don't have time. Number five. Submit, or yeah, giving thanks to the Father in the name of Jesus. Number five, submitting to one another, submitting to one another. What does that mean? It means we are peacemakers. 
That means we avoid strife, contentions, arguing, and fighting whenever possible, right? There are certain times that fighting is required, um, but there's many times that we can pass up fighting and be peacemakers and not be contentious and and show love, especially in those interpersonal relationships with our spouse and with our, our children, right? Uh, So it's walking in that submitted heart, that humility, and that love that prefers one another. The last one is walking in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? It's actually in the New Testament, just in case you wondered. It's in the book of Acts. The churches there walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and they were blessed and they were multiplied in that process. The fear of the Lord is a reverential respect and awe of God. Amen. It's it's holding him in awe. It's holding him that he is who he, listen, I I don't have any words to describe how awesome he is. You're just going to have to encounter him yourself. The closest thing I can think of is when I was at his throne, it'd be like if you could suddenly walk on the face of the sun, just walk on the sun. It'd be kind of overwhelming, right? It's 10 million degrees or whatever, 10,000 degrees on the surface and millions of degrees internally and, 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 if you could somehow do that and survive, being in the presence of the throne of the Father, it's that overwhelming to your senses, but in a good, awesome, beyond description way. Our God is awesome. He's worthy of our respect. And we need to get a revelation of that. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for watching today. Special thanks goes to those who give generously to this ministry. It's because of you that this ministry is possible. You can click the link in the description below if you want to give. Also, You can subscribe, hit the notification bell. That way you can get reminded every time we post new messages just like this. Feel free to like, comment, and share this with friends and family. Tag us on any social stories such as Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, at Edmund Oasis. God bless.